Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, last time uh, we ended, well, we were talking about functions of random variables, of course. And there um, we talked in particular, one of the uh, sort of standard examples that I did was uh, the probability integral transformation. And I talked about how this could be useful for generating random draws. Like if, for instance, if you were interested in writing a program where um, you wanted to simulate random draws from some distribution, that sort of using kind of the reverse of the probability integral transformation could be uh, useful. And there seemed to be some demand for an example. So what I'm going to do, I'm not going to do exactly that, but I'm going to do an example that uh, is quite related, and then we'll sort of talk about the relation in a second. Okay. Oh, let's start with housekeeping notes. I don't think there's anything uh, sort of controversial here. Uh, problems that 3 is due on Wednesday, keep an eye out for problem set 4. Um, today, more on functions of random variables. Uh, we will start talking about moments of distributions today. And I'm going to finish off the lecture today with kind of an extended example uh, of um, auction, auction theory, basically. Um, and then uh, Wednesday, we're going to talk about properties of moments, conditional moments, and so forth. Okay? Okay, so here is the example. And um, just uh, sit tight. There will be a connection to the probability integral transformation example uh, here. Okay, so suppose we start with a random variable x that has a uniform distribution on the unit interval. And we have some function. We just were given this function or came up with this function that we want to use to transform uh, x. Okay? So what is uh, the uh, distribution of this transformed random variable. Well, we know how to do this. Remember, we can figure out first what the CDF of y is, and we do that in steps. We sort of argue what it is in steps. And then once we have the CDF, then we take the derivative and we get the PDF, right? So let's do that. Oh, but first, note that the induced support of y is uh, just the um, sort of non-negative uh, real values. Uh, log zero is undefined, right? Pardon me? Log zero is undefined. Yeah, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually matter too much because the probability at any particular point is equal to zero. So we don't have to worry too much about what happens at any particular point, but yeah. Okay, so the, in, the induced support is, uh, is, is the following. Okay, and we'll use that in a second. Okay, so now let's go through step by step, figure out what the CDF of y is. So remember, we'll start with uh, the definition of the CDF. And then we plug in this function that we have. So we plug in negative log of x over lambda and into the probability statement. We solve for x, okay, standard stuff. And then, um, we don't actually have to do the integral. So most of the time at this point, what we do is we, we write down the PDF of x, and then we integrate over the relevant area defined by this probability statement. But we're going to take a shortcut today, and that's because x has a uniform distribution. And so the probability that x, so x is uniform, 0, 1. The probability that x is greater than any number is just 1 minus that number. Okay? That's, that's only because uh, x has a uniform 0, 1 distribution. Okay? So um, when we're dealing with uniform random variables, we can often skip the step where we have to do the integral. Okay? Okay, so here's what we have. That's the induced support. That's the CDF of the new random variable. Okay? And so we just take the derivative to get the PDF. And here's what we get. OK? Fine. Everything's standard. Does this distribution look familiar? So we've seen this at least a couple times this semester, I think. It might be familiar from other contexts. Exponential, exactly. OK? So now, recall that I said 
that if you have a distribution and you want, say, you, you want um, the function that transforms a, a, a uniform 0, 1 to that distribution, what you do is you just take the inverse of the CDF and you use that uh, function to transform the random variable. Okay? So now let's just go back, take a step back, uh, take the inverse of the CDF uh, that we found above, and let's see if it's the same function that we used to transform the random variable ori originally. Okay, so here's our CDF, and let's just find the inverse function, okay? So we're just writing x equals 1 minus uh, e to the negative lambda y and solving uh, for y. Okay, and we do that in a couple steps. And then we plug in the capital X and Y because this is now the function we're going to use to transform the random variable X. Okay? But that's not the same function that we used in the example. What's going on? Any thoughts about what's going on here? X, sorry, x and 1 minus x is the same, distribution. same distribution, exactly, okay? So when I said that you can take the inverse of the CDF and use that to transform a uniform 0, 1 random variable to get the distribution of, of or to get, you know, sort of the, the PDF of the, the random variable that had this, that you're, whose CDF you're using, okay, when I said that, I didn't say that was unique, okay? So in particular, there might be lots of different functions that are going to transform a uniform 0, 1 random variable into an exponential random variable. And these happen to be two of the functions. And in fact, if you, uh, you, know, if you sort of look at the functions, you might be able to convince yourself that these are going to um, give you the same distribution. If you use the, these two different functions to transform a uniform 0, 1 random variable, why? Because 1 minus x, this random variable, is also going to have a uniform 0, 1 distribution. Okay? I didn't prove it, but it's probably not very hard to believe that that's true. Okay? And you can prove it if you want. Okay? Okay, so what's going on? Both of these functions work. And um, the, in particular, the reason why both of them work is that, um, as I said, if x is uniform 0, 1, 1 minus x is as well. OK? So there is a lot of information in a PDF. A PDF contains, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a whole function. It sort of tells you all kinds of things. And sometimes it tells you a lot uh, of things that we don't actually care about. OK? Perhaps we don't care, you know, precisely what the shape of the distribution of our random variable is in every region of the, the reals or something like that. Um, maybe what we really want is we want some way to summarize. Uh, and, and I should say sometimes we do care about that and sometimes we don't, okay? But in the times that we don't, uh, maybe what we want to do is just, just summarize some of the most salient features of a distribution, okay? Where it is centered. Uh, where it reaches its peak, how spread out it is, uh, whether it's symmetric, how thick its tails are, et cetera. Okay? And so what we do is we define something called a moment or a series of moments of a distribution to help us summarize some of these most salient features. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Okay, so here are some distributions. I just drew them. I don't know what they are. Um, and the one moment, or I guess three different uh, moments that are somewhat related, uh, that you've probably all run across in one context or another, um, are mean, median, and mode. And they all describe in different ways where the distribution is located or centered. Okay? So all of these, uh, all of these moments are going to be um, sort of useful in, in various ways. Okay, so the mode is the point where the PDF reaches its highest value, and I've indicated it on these three distributions. The median is the point above and below which the integral of the PDF is equal to one half. Okay, so uh, whatever 
uh, whatever point is the point at which the integral below is equal to one half and above is equal to one half is the median of the distribution. And then the mean, uh, also known as the expectation or expected value, the distribution, is defined in this way. I'll give you a sort of a geometric interpretation of it in just a second. But um, basically, the way we define the mean of the distribution, or the expectation, is just the integral over the support of the distribution of uh, x times the PDF of x. OK? OK, so if we need to find the expectation of a continuous random variable, we just integrate the PDF times the value over the support. That's just what I had on the previous slide. And I should also point out, uh, because this comes in handy quite a bit, uh, the discrete analog is just what you would expect it to be. Instead of uh, integrating, we sum. But we sum up all over all of the possible values of x. Okay? So it's just summing up uh, x times the, the probability that x, you know, probability of x at that point. Okay? Couple comments about uh, you know, sort of notation and terminology. Um, I will often use capital E of x to denote the, the mean of a distribution, the expectation of a distribution. Um, but we, I'll often also use the uh, Greek letter mu. And so those uh, are sometimes used interchangeably. And this is the sort of geometric uh, distribution I prom or geometric interpretation I promised you. So if we think of the PDF literally as a density, the expectation is the balancing point of that density. Okay? So this is different from the median of a distribution because uh, if you think about um, how I describe the median, it's the point at which the integral uh, both above and below is equal to one half. If you set, you know, if you have a median of a distribution and you shift probability on one side of it, the median doesn't change, okay, because the, the, um, the, the uh, integral on that side is still equal to one half, but uh, the expectation might change, okay? You take a chunk of probability and you shift it out, uh, then the sort of, um, the expectation of the distribution shifts out as well. Okay? And the, the terminology does get a little more complicated, complicating or complicated when we start talking about estimation, because we're going to talk about something called a sample mean, which is quite definitely different from this. It's related, but it's different. Uh, and so then we've got to keep mean and sample mean kind of straight in our heads. But I, we'll be able to do it. OK, oh, here. <laughs> OK, so uh, here's just a quick example of uh, calculating the expectation of a distribution. Okay, So let's suppose we have an exponential PDF. And how do we calculate uh, its expectation? Well, it's just plugging into the formula. It's just going to be the integral over the support of the exponential, which is 0 to uh, infinity, of x times the PDF of x. Okay? If we didn't put x in here, of course, we know that integral is just equal to 1. right? But then we, put, we uh, uh, put the x in the formula, and that's the formula for calculating the expectation. Okay, So specifically, in the case of the exponential, that's what it looks like. Um, I'm skipping the uh, calculus and just giving you the answer. And it turns out there's a good reason for me to skip, it, skip the calculus this time. I didn't realize when I picked this example, uh, you have to um, do integration by parts to get it. So if you want a little practice on your calculus skills, go ahead and do it. If you don't, you can just take my word for it. This is the <laughs> expectation of an exponential uh, distribution. OK. So now, um, sort of having, having a few of these things under our belt, we're going to uh, take a little side trip into auction theory. Okay? So why, what do auctions have to do with probabilities? Well, there's, there's sort of a number of reasons that uh, I want to take this little side trip. Um, one reason is that uh, we have, um, last lecture, we talked about um, order statistics. And it turns out that order statistics are a very useful mathematical tool to analyze um, auctions. Why is that? Um, an, 
an obvious thing to do when you're talking about auctions is to model bids in an auction as an IID random sample and the winning bid, which is typically the highest bid, as the nth order statistic from that random sample. Okay, so we will do that. Um, another reason that I like, uh, I, you know, I want to take this little side trip into auction theory is that, you know, most of this class we're going to be sort of giving you tools that help you uh, sort of empirically analyze uh, questions in social science. And here is an example of probability tools that help you theoretically analyze uh, some questions in social science. So it's not really the main focus of, our, of the class. I mean, the main focus of the class is sort of data analysis and, and empirically analyzing questions in social science. But I did want to show you one example where you could take tools from probability and help you uh, sort of uh, help you do some theoretical uh, analysis of questions in social science. Okay, and furthermore, uh, we also will uh, compute some expectations along the way, so we'll get a little practice with that. Okay, so here are some things that are sold at auction. Okay. Uh, there's over here, there's a Picasso. So if you have a Picasso sitting around and you'd like to liquidate that and maybe you know, use it to pay for your MIT tuition or something, um, what would you do? You probably wouldn't just put it up on Craigslist at a posted price. Uh, you'd probably go to Christie's or Sotheby's and auction it off, okay? We'll talk about, we can talk about the, the, the decision between posted price and auction in, in a second. But start thinking about that question. Why would you decide to sell that at auction as opposed to a posted price? Uh, down here is some livestock. Uh, livestock in, in the US is typically sold at auction uh, before um, going to the butcher shop. Uh, this is a picture of radio spectrum. Okay, So it used to be in, in the United States and pretty much all countries. Radio spectrum uh, was sort of controlled by the government and given away for free uh, to radio stations and uh, television stations and things like that. Um, and it was given away typically with uh, conditions, like you have to put on programming that's you know, uh, uh, useful for the public good or something like that. But you know, it was just given away. And then at some point, I think it was in the 80s or 90s maybe, I'm not sure, uh, the U.S. government decided we're sitting on a gold mine. We have a hugely valuable asset here. And furthermore, we don't actually know. We know it's hugely valuable. We don't know exactly how valuable it is. Why don't we start auctioning it off? And so the United States uh, started uh, running uh, spectrum auctions. And they still do for various parts of the spectrum. Uh, and now this is sort of common practice among lots of countries. Okay. Uh, down here is a picture of an F-16. So um, Lockheed, who, who produces these? Lockheed Martin? I'm not sure. Okay. So Lockheed Martin does not sell F-16s at auction, obviously. But in fact, they are acquired through an auction mechanism, kind of a reverse auction. So when the U.S. government wants uh, to buy the sixth generation fighter jets, what do they do? They sort of write down the specifications that they want in the sixth generation fighter jets. And then they let all of the people who would, all of the firms who would like to produce those fighter jets bid. So they, you know, the bids can be very complicated, but they boil down to here's how we can fulfill your specifications and here's what we'll charge. And then the US government uh, buys the fighter jets from the lowest bidder. So that's called a procurement auction, and it's kind of a reverse auction. Okay, so instead of the highest bidder winning um, and purchasing, the lowest bidder wins and sells sells the product. Okay, um, I went on eBay a couple days ago when I was making up this slide, and I found some uh, collectible. Uh, beer tray tin signs. I guess they're just beer trays. I don't know. Did anyone, has anyone heard of tech beer? Did you know tech beer existed? No, we never heard of tech beer. I, don't, I, I didn't know if it was like maybe the official MIT beer or something like that. But 
But if you're inclined, you can buy memorabilia like tech beer <laughs> trays on eBay. And I think the starting bid was only eight bucks there. So you can get them pretty cheaply. Um, up on the very top where it says Amica, uh, do you know what that is? You've seen a zillion of them, so you should, they should, it should look familiar. It's an ad on, you don't necessarily know, but Google. Google. Yeah, turns out it's an ad on Google. So one thing which you may or may not know is every time you type in a search term on Google, an auction is run. Every time anyone anywhere in the world types in a search term on Google, an auction is run. And that auction determines which ads you are served. So I went on Google and I typed auto insurance, and that was one of the ads I was served. Okay, someone paid Google for the, um, for the you know, ability to serve me an ad when I typed in auto insurance. Okay, does anyone know what this is in the upper right corner? Tulip bulbs, great. So, um, <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll talk, I have one slide just for fun on uh, the tulip bulbs in just a second, so we'll get to those. But basically, in, um, well, tulip bulbs uh, not only were auctioned off in the 1600s in Amsterdam, but uh, you know, sort of a new auction mechanism was devised to handle um, you know, sort of the, the auctioning off of tulip bulbs. And I'll, I'll mention more about this in a second. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Old map, but actually it's, uh, it's, it's what's on the map I'm trying to represent, not the map itself. The Roman Empire, exactly. So the Roman Empire was actually auctioned off, believe it or not. Okay, so let me go to the next slide and I'll give you a couple details. So this is, again, these next two slides are just for fun. But So the Praetorian Guard, which was sort of the, the elite uh, military officers in the, in the um, Roman Empire, um, found themselves without an emperor. And they decided to auction off the Roman Empire to the highest bidder. This is in 193 uh, CE. Okay? So Marcus Didius Severus Julianus uh, was the highest bidder. And he ended up paying 25,000 sesterces per soldier uh, for the Roman Empire. So he served as empire for, er, emperor for 66 days before being executed. Um, I don't know precisely what happened, whether there was a follow-on auction after he was executed. If there was, I can bet that the bids were lower. <laughs> That's my guess. But Did they like, not have democracy yet? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm sort of not an expert on um, on this on this uh, time in, in history in the Roman Empire. Um, I just th uh, that was a time when the Praetorian Guard had a lot of power, so they just decided to exploit that power and auction off the empire. So yes. But apparently this sparked a civil war. Oh, this, the, the, the execution sparked a civil war? Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, um, so the word auction actually comes from the Latin octio, meaning increase. And that is a description or a partial description of one of the very common auction mechanisms where the price increases until all but one bidder um, drops out. And uh, the highest bidder um, is uh, in, in an auction in ancient Rome was called the emptor. That's the, the Latin term for it. Okay? And obviously we, we sort of use, you know, we are familiar with that term from, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, phrase buyer beware, a caveat emptor. Okay? Um, auctions were used very extensively in ancient Rome. They were used to sell plunder, household effects, slaves, wives, commodities, etc. Okay. Um, okay. And now uh, the um, to the tulip bulbs. So, as I said, in 1600s, traders from the Ottoman Empire uh, brought tulip bulbs back to Holland. They were unknown in Holland, so. Um, so no one knew exactly what the demand was going to be. 
And furthermore, supply was fixed in the short run. There was no way that they could sort of generate more tulip bulbs in the short run because it takes seven to 12 years to go from a tulip seed, you know what existed, anyhow, a tulip seed to a tradable bulb. So the, the, whatever the, the traders brought back from the Ottoman Empire, that was sort of what they had. So it turns out demand was really high. And what the traders did is they invented uh, basically an auction mechanism called the Dutch auction, uh, where you start at a high price and you decrease the price until someone uh, buys the tulip bulb. And I don't remember off the top of my head what tulip bulbs ended up selling for, but it was you know, sort of thousands of dollars in you know, sort of uh, current dollars or something. I mean, huge amounts of money. You have a question? So what if multiple people take a bid? Do they start going up again? Oh, so I, how, you're asking how are ties resolved? I don't know. Maybe they have some, you know, maybe if two people put up their hand at exactly the same time, then the auctioneer picks one of them at random. But, yeah. So there's this, I actually have a board game called Merchants of Amsterdam. Has anyone ever played this? No? Okay. So it has this little thing where you, you like you um, a timer kind of thing. It's like a, it's a it's it's to to uh, do this the Dutch mechanism or Dutch auction mechanism. So you turn the timer, and then basically everyone's watching the price of the commodity tick down, and then you're you're all sort of like sitting around the timer, and whoever presses the timer first wins the auction. And so you know that's I mean. At least in that case, someone is actually pressing it, and that's how the ties get resolved. But okay. And for people who are interested in uh, financial innovation, the tulip panic, the Dutch tulip panic. So I should say, prices went went up very high, but then they also there were also there was also sort of a spectacular crash, um, and that was why it was called the tulip panic. Um, and, but for people interested in financial innovation, options and future contracts were also pioneered during this period uh, to sort of help deal with the sort of uh, interesting uh, financial setting uh, that was caused by these uh, tulip bulbs. Okay. Yes? That, I don't know. Does anyone know? How long did the Dutch tulip bulb bubble last? Last like a year, 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 two, year and a half. Year and a half? Okay. Cool. Okay, so those, those, uh, those couple slides were mostly for fun. But um, let's go back to the question of, uh, you know, sort of selling a product at posted price uh, versus auctioning. Okay? So here now is a slide of things that are sold at posted price. You buy fruit at posted prices. You would never go into the stop and shop and you know, sort of like engage in some kind of an auction in the produce aisle or something like that. You just pay whatever price is posted. Um, when I bought my iPhone, I just bought it at a posted price. Uh, when I buy iced tea every day, um, I just go in, you know, I buy whatever the price is posted. Clothing is the same. Uh, the new Macklemore and Ryan Lewis uh, CD, uh, you will just, if you buy that, you will just buy it at a posted price. I heard it wasn't very good. That's what the reviews say. But I, I, I'm not an expert. Yeah? But this is in the U.S., right? In, the, in other cultures, so, you go so, in. so that's right. There are cultural differences between what is, what is sold at posted prices and what is auctioned. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Sometimes really what and you sometimes can. you can negotiate a posted price, which is a negotiation's a little bit different than than you know selling something at auction, but uh, but it has some of the elements of of an auction for sure. Like buying vegetables from a vegetable seller in India is a reverse auction. You keep reducing the price until he refuses to sell at a lower price, and then you buy. It. So, so he has a posted price, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And then you say, no, I'll give you a half of that. Yeah. And, and, then and then he says, okay. And then you say, no, I'll give you a quarter of that? Well, no. no. Well, you start with the lowest. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a standard bargaining. Yeah, exactly.
yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so, so definitely. So that's a, that's a, a very important point that there are cultural differences. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, you know, sort of across across cultures about what's uh, auctioned and or you know sort of haggled over and what's sold at a posted price. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, uh, I guess the other point is that uh, haggling isn't quite the same as an auction, but it has, has some, many of the same characteristics. Um, so in the US, uh, houses are also sold at posted prices, which has always been a little puzzling uh, for me. And it doesn't, a house doesn't quite fit in to the, you know, in terms of the, its characteristics, it doesn't quite fit into what uh, other things are sold at posted prices in the U.S. Now, of course, there often is a, a bargaining that goes on after, uh, you know, sort of in, in the process of buying a house. And there can be bidding wars as well if you have a certain That's right. That's right. I tried to talk my parents into auctioning their house off, and it didn't. They, <laughs> they, they said, you know, you and all your crazy economics ideas, no way. <laughs> um, yeah. OK. And, and actually, um, I don't know if you guys have been on eBay uh, recently, if you buy things on eBay. Uh, it's, it's true that most things on eBay today are sold at posted prices, not uh, through an auction mechanism. Okay? And that's a big change. We'll, we'll talk about that as well. OK, so what determines whether a seller will decide to sell an item at a posted price or auction it off? So based on your own experience, based on the products that we saw here, what would you say are some of the factors that a seller might consider? Yes? Supply. Pardon me? Supply. Supply meaning, can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, like if the thing is common, then it doesn't make sense to auction it because right. Like you can spy it anywhere, but if the thing is really unique, then yeah. you want to auction it because you don't. And if it's hard to determine the value of the good, then you use the auction. Yeah, absolutely right. So if you have a product that's unique and or hard to determine its value, then you're more likely to auction it off than sell it at a posted price. Okay, um, and uh, I guess. You know, maybe this is sort of an obvious point, but the the reason that that's the case is because that when you auction off a product, then you're getting a lot of price information um, for free, or a lot, sorry, a lot of value, a lot of information in the valuation of that product for free. Okay, so um, you know. It, you, you're getting not only, I mean, depending on the mechanism, you get not only the winning bid, but you may get sort of lots of information on the entire distribution of valuations for this product. Okay. Um, you also hinted at another thing, which was that there could be, um, relatedly, there could be an asymmetry of information between the buyer and the seller. There could be situations where um, there is a lot of information about the value of a product out there, but the seller doesn't have that information. So go back to the, um, to the case of the spectrum auction. When the US government is auctioning off a slice of the radio spectrum, um, they know that the people bidding on that slice of the spectrum have done huge amounts of research. And they, they, they sell products that are going to be using the spectrum. They have lots of engineers and experts uh, you know, sort of predicting what uh, they'll be able to sell their product for and what products they'll be able to, to uh, invent that take advantage of that spectrum and so forth. And the, the US government doesn't have, isn't privy to any of that research. Okay? So there's really sort of a big informational asymmetry there between the seller and the buyer. Okay. Um, other, let me see what I have here. Well, actually, that's okay. So we've been talking mostly about this sort of second point: information. Uh, the seller receives free information on the value of the good, and in fact, possibly information on the whole distribution. Um, but how about transactions costs? So it's re it's sort of a little ridiculous to think about me going into the stop and shop, and you know, bargaining over, um, you know, sort of every single thing that I buy in the stop and shop. Or, you know, having to engage in some kind of an auction. 
uh, on every single thing that I'm buying in, in my trip to the stop and shop, right? And again, you know, so there, there are cultural differences. There are places where if I go to the market, I might, in fact, haggle over everything. But there's big transactions costs associated with that, right? And so you would think that maybe small ticket items, um, the seller is not likely to lose that much. I'm not likely to lose that much if I, you know, uh, if I pay too, you know, if I pay slightly higher price, it might not be worth it to either of us to engage in an auction. It might just be, a, you know, we might be able to minimize our transactions cost by just doing the transaction at a posted price. Okay? Uh, I don't know if uh, this information is currently is like available, but historically, was were posted prices like coming quite much later than, say, like an auction type mechanism? Um, so and the barter system, I'm sure. Came yeah, yeah. As well. Yeah. So you you bring up a very interesting point. So the question was, in various markets, do auctions kind of uh, precede posted prices? And um, I, you know, I think that's that's an interesting question. I can't say with great certainty. Uh, that, you know, I'm sort of not a historian of prices, so I can't say with great certainty if that's true, but there are reasons to believe why it, uh, th that it could. And um, this sort of second bullet point suggests um, one reason, which is that when a market is new, um, there's, a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of sort of um, information asymmetry. And then once a market becomes more mature, the sellers know what they're going to be able to sell this product for. And um, so yeah, there are definitely reasons to believe that that kind of evolution can happen. And actually, that could be a, a part of what's uh, going on in eBay, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. OK? So uh, what do these two, you know, sort of keeping in mind this sort of information story and the transactions cost story, what are the goods that are likely to be auctioned instead of sold at posted prices? Unique goods are likely to be auctioned because people don't know, you know, the sellers don't know what they're worth. Expensive goods might be more likely to be sold at auction than cheaper goods just because the transactions costs might be a fixed cost that doesn't scale with the size of the transaction. Um, but any loss uh, or foregone surplus from uncertainty might scale with the, the size of the transaction. Uh, goods where characteristics are costly to assess. Uh, goods where buyers know more than the sellers, goods with heterogene heterogeneity and buyer valuation. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that we would expect to be auctioned instead of uh, sold at posted prices. Okay, so now let's consider a simple model to illustrate this point about information in particular. Okay, so we're going to start with n potential buyers of some good, and let's suppose that their valuations are independent. So I'm, I'm auctioning off some good, and all of the potential buyers have a valuation. All the valuations are independent, and they're distributed uniformly on the unit interval. Okay? So they have a, a uniform 0, 1 distribution of valuations. Now the seller has a choice. The seller can offer the good at no cost at a posted price, or the seller can auction it off. And the seller knows the distribution of the valuations. So knows this uniform 0, 1 piece, but doesn't know what the individual potential buyers, what their valuations are. So let's consider the posted price first. So the seller is going to is going to set a price P and sell the good if there's any potential buyer who has valuation greater than or equal to P. Right? Is that agreed? Makes sense? OK, so we can write down uh, a, um, an expression for the expected profit in this case. And that's just going to be equal to the price times the probability that uh, there is at least one person with a valuation above P. Okay, Where did I get this expected profit? Well, let me, OK, so let me just first emphasize uh, what, these, what the notation means here. So this is what I get if I sell the product. And this is one, oh yes, this, the second term there is 1 minus the CDF 
of the nth order statistic from a uniform uh, 0, 1 evaluated at p. Does everyone understand where this came from? Nope? OK, so remember the definition of the nth order statistic. So nth order statistic from a uniform 0, 1 distribution is just the, um, it's just the highest value, highest realization, OK, from an from a IID random sample from this uh, uniform 0, 1. And so basically, in order to sell this good, I need to have the nth order statistic. There, there can be other order statistics that are greater than, B, that greater than p as well. But I need to have at least one. In other words, the nth order statistic greater than p. OK? And so this is, in fact, this is, this is uh, the probability that I sell the good. And this is how I, how I calculate that probability. Yes? This probability is basically just the number of people who are ready to purchase it for a price beyond more. The number of people who are willing to purchase it? No, it's just, it's just the uh, probability. So I'm going to, you know, I can sort of uh, get the distribution of the nth order statistic from this uniform 0, 1 distribution. <coughs> and I'm just saying, what's the probability that the nth order statistic is greater than or equal to some value what p? You think of it this way, that, uh, that p number of people Sorry, number of people who are ready to buy it at the price of P or more, the probability of that. So out of us, N people over here, if suppose 10 of us are ready to purchase it at P mm -hmm. or more, so then that probability I, times the price is the expected. I don't think that's quite the right intuition. Um, so all I care about is the, the probability that, that one person is, is going to buy it if I post the price at P. That's all I care about. I don't care about how many other people. And furthermore, we know how to find the distribution of that highest price, because it's just the nth order statistic. So I, it, it's, I, I think that the intuition uh, that you're coming up with is kind of heading in the right direction, but I don't think it's precisely correct. And so I, yeah, I think it's, it's more useful to just think you need at least one person who has valuation above the price you post, and what's the distribution of the, the, the highest value? Well, it's just the, the nth order statistic. OK? OK? And I, I should step back uh, just uh, for a moment and um, mention how does this formula for expectation here square with the formula we saw for expectation? So obviously, the, the formula that you, that you saw most often for expectation in the beginning of the lecture was this sort of integral. It was an expectation of a continuous random variable. This is a discrete random variable here. So we have to go back to, to um, when I flashed up the, the, um, uh, the equation for computing the expectation from a discrete random variable. Okay, So think about that. It's, um, OK, so we're just summing up uh, the um, you know, sort of uh, probability function for each value of x times x okay, to get the expectation. And here, the, um, this, is, this distribution has only two points. It's a discrete distribution that has only two points. Uh, one is um, the probability that we get 0 from this transaction. And that's the probability, that's basically uh, the CDF of the nth order statistic evaluated at p. So it's a probability, it's 1 minus uh, th that probability. Okay? But then that gets multiplied by p, or sorry, it gets multiplied by 0. And so that term goes away. And so basically we have two terms in the expectation. One term is the probability that you don't sell it times 0, which is what you get if you don't sell it. So that term goes away, plus the probability that you sell it times what you get if you do sell it. And that's uh, this equation. OK? OK, so, and now, um, oh, I said just apply the discrete formula. Note that the first term is 0. OK, so we've got an expression for the expected profit. 
And um, if I go back to my notes on um, order statistics, I can uh, remind myself what the CDF for the nth order statistic from a uniform uh, zero one distribution is. And so I can plug that in and I get this expression for expected profits. Okay? Okay, so now for a little economics. If this if this didn't confuse you enough already. Yep. Explain the P to the power N. This is just that if you go back and you look uh, on your notes about where we talked about um, uh, in th uh, sort of order statistics and we talked about the CDF of order statistics, basically what I'm doing is I'm just getting the formula for the CDF of the uh, nth order statistic and plugging it in. Okay. Okay. So now for a little bit of economics. So we've got uh, an expression for expected profit. But um, as we often do, as economists often do, we assume that the seller is going to do what's in his best interest. Okay? Even though we realize that doesn't always happen, uh, in order to sort of solve our models, this is typically the assumption we make. We figure that the seller is going to do what's in his best interest. In other words, set P to maximize his profits, okay? given that he knows what distribution the valuations are coming from. Okay, so how do we find what that optimal P is? Well, it's just a little calculus, okay? So we take the derivative of the expected profit function with respect to price, we set that equal to zero, and then we solve for price, okay? So, by the way, this isn't, I, we know this isn't an economics class and we don't have an economics prerequisite. We're not gonna hold you guys responsible for profit maximizing behavior of, of, uh, of um, you know, sellers. But I think it's good to be exposed to this kind of thinking regardless. It's, it's very um, sort of powerful way of, uh, of thinking and, and solving problems. Okay, so what we do is we just take the derivative, we set it equal to zero, and we solve for the optimal price, and that's what it is, okay? So we get that it's the nth root of one over n plus one. Remember, n is the number of bidders. Or sorry, the number of potential buyers, not bidders in this case. Okay? Num number of potential buyers. Okay? So, and then we can also take this optimal price, plug it back into the expected profit formula, and we get the expected profit under that optimal price is uh, this value here, okay? Okay, so now we can just plug in different ends and we can see what price this seller's gonna set for different ends and we can see what profit he makes the different ends. Okay, so here's a little table. Uh, N goes from one to nine. So if you only have one potential buyer and you know that his valuation is drawn from uniform zero one distribution, the optimal price that you're going to set is one half. You're going to sell the product half of the time. That makes sense, right? You, you're going to be out of luck half the time. Uh, but then uh, the, because you sell it half the time and you get profit uh, one half when you do sell it, your expected profit is one quarter. Okay? And then, you know, the, the, the you know, sort of reasoning uh, applies as you go down the table. To get this table, of course, I'm just plugging into the, uh, the formulas for optimal pricing that, that we derived before. Okay? Yes? Sorry, that's, that's the um, notation we use for profit. So in a probability class, it's not always, <laughs> pi is not always going to stand for profit. But uh, yeah, in, in this particular example, uh, pi just means profit. Yeah. So that's, that's an economics thing. Okay, so the posted price is rising as the number of potential buyers goes up. Does this make sense, sort of intuitively? You have like 100 buyers. You know 
we know something about the nth order statistic when you have 100 buyers, right? It's going to be really close to one. It's going to have a high probability it's close to one. So you're going to set a higher price. So that makes sense. And expected profits also go up, okay, as n goes up. Okay, oh, so I said this. This is a consequence of the distribution of the nth order statistic and how it changes as n, n increases. Okay, so now we know what profit the seller is going to make uh, for a posted price as a function of the number of potential buyers. So let's see how he's going to do in the auction. Okay, so we're going to assume uh, what's called an English auction where the price of the good is going to gradually increase and potential buyers, you can think about everyone starting with their hand up. Who wants this Picasso for a dollar? Everyone has their hand up. Who wants it for two dollars? Everyone has their hands up. Who wants it for 40 million? The hands start going down, okay? So um, until there's only one person left, okay? And that buyer's valuation, sorry, uh, there's, sorry, there's only one person left, okay? We're using V sub I to stand for buyer I's valuation for the product. And then when only one buyer is left, he gets the good at V sub N minus one, the second highest valuation. Why is that? Why does he get it at the second highest valuation? Yep. Because until the last person falls away, he might have a higher price than the good. That's right. He, the, the auction's done when the second to last person uh, takes his hand down, okay? So we have no idea what the valuation of the winner is. It's, we just know it's, uh, it's above the second highest valuation. But he gets it at the second highest valuation. Okay? So this is um, the classic open outcry auction that you see you know, on TV shows and things like that. Okay? Okay. So here, to compute the expected profits, we're going to need the distribution of the n minus first order statistic. Uh, from the uniform zero one. So why the n minus first order statistic? Because that's the, the price at which this thing gets auctioned off, okay? Okay, so if I look up, if I go back to my notes, actually I don't think this is in your notes, I'd have to figure it out or, or look it up in some other you know, textbook or something. Uh, I can figure out what the PDF of the n minus first order statistic from the uniform zero one distribution is, and this is what it is, okay? And so we'll just, to, to uh, compute, oh, yeah, and uh, again, we're assuming this is the distribution of the valuations. Okay, so then to compute the expected profit in the auction, all we do is we integrate over the support of the distribution the, prop, the, the PDF of the N minus first order statistic, that's what the seller is going to get at auction for this product, times X. I put the X at the end, so it's right before the, the little DX. Okay? And this is just the formula for uh, calculating expectation from a, um, from a continuous random variable. Okay, is everyone on board with this? So then we just, uh, you know, sort of perform the integral and we end up getting n minus 1 over n plus 1. Okay? That's the, that's the formula. And so we can make a similar table to the one we saw before where we have n here. I'm, I'm not going to put p on the table here because in an auction you're not setting a price. Okay? It's just, uh, you know, sort of, it just gets sold at uh, the, the n minus first uh, order statistic. But we can also put the um, uh, expected profit in the case of the auction. And let me put up the last column of the previous table to compare. Okay? So if, if we only have why do we get no profit if uh, there's only one potential buyer or one bidder? Difficulty. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the, you, you, the, the auction's over when there's only one guy left. If you start with one guy, he, he gets it for free. Okay? So, um, so anyhow, the, the, for one, if there's one potential buyer or one bidder, um, you, you, do a ver you do very poorly if you auction it off. Okay? And that's uh, compared to expected profit from a posted price of a quarter. If you have two, um, then you end up doing a little bit better uh, with the posted price than the auction. But uh, the auction's catching up. And then for n equals 3 and above, you're, you do better uh, with the auction than the posted price. So I think I have. <coughs> yep. And I should say, by the way, this is not just, um, it, it's not that uh, this is true for n equals 2 through 9 and then something crazy happens below. This is general. You can show that uh, for uh, any value of n greater than 2 in this particular um, model, uh, the auction does do better. OK? So what did this model tell us? Well, conditional on the assumptions of the model, of course. It told us that uh, the seller is going to do better with an auction when uh, the number of bidders is large. Okay? So that might, might be consistent with intuition you have, or it might not be. I mean, I'm not sure that I had a really strong intuition. Certainly, in both cases of the posted price and the auction, the seller is going to do better if there are more buyers. Okay? That's, that seems pretty clear to me. Um, but this model, at least this simple model, shows us that uh, the seller does better with an auction when n is large, um, large enough. Okay? And, but here, here, was the, here was the sort of um, amazing thing that you might not have realized when we were going through the, the example or going through this model. The seller didn't need to know anything about the distribution of the valuations in the auction. Okay? So um, the, this, the seller did, in fact, need to know the distribution for the post to set the optimal posted price. But in the auction, the, the seller's not setting a posted price or not setting a price. Okay? So the seller actually didn't need to know um, what, the, uh, what the, the sort of underlying distribution of valuations was in the auction model. Okay? And furthermore, you could work through the same example using different distributions uh, for the fixed price part of it. So like assume that the seller got, you know, got the distribution wrong and thought that the, the valuations were uniform on 0 to 1 half or uniform 0 to 2 when in fact they were uniform 0 to 1. And you'll see that the posted price does much worse in that case. Okay? So the, the important point here is that there's a large reliance when you're setting a posted price on knowing the distribution of valuations. That reliance isn't there with the auction. Okay? And then the third thing to point out this model doesn't have any transactions cost in it. So we talked about how transactions costs might be important, and you might not want to auction off things that you know, are kind of low value items uh, just because it's a hassle and selling at a posted price is easier. This model doesn't have that in it at all. And so um, you, know, the, you have to sort of keep that in mind when you're interpreting the, the results. OK, yep. Um, is it correct that transaction costs to gather all the people to the auction? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, like I said, that none of those transactions costs are in this model. So you could write another model that had transactions costs that could be a function of the number of bidders or something like that. And the transactions costs could, you know, I mean, you, you know, you could think of various ways to model it. But if it's like a like, uh, I don't know if it's like wealthy people, like you have to like give them food and like, it's like a big auction. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's like, yeah, if you're running an auction at Sotheby's, you can't like serve chicken fingers or something. Yeah, that's right. You have to have sort of a nice auction house and yeah, exactly. So this model will tell you how much you, you have to spend to 
make the auction happen because this is the optimal, this is optimal. We have fixed price. The gap is the money you can spend to for the auction. Yeah, that's right. You could you could sort of think of yeah, think of have that interpretation of the gap as well. Yes. Um, so I don't understand the part where we the doing this calculation without need to know about an auction distribution because in n minus one first statistics we are assuming that we know the auction. Oh, we needed to know, but the seller didn't need to know because the seller is not setting a price. What is the seller doing? Seller's just auctioning it off, right? So we needed to know in order to calculate the expected profit. Um, and, but yeah, but he didn't need to know. I thought the seller is doing this competition to see whether yes. auction is better auction or not. If, if the seller wants to do this calculation, then the seller would, would have to know in both cases. Absolutely. Yep, yep, you're right. No, I'm glad for, for that clarification. Yep. You choose, but if he gets it wrong, then he just maybe he has chosen the wrong mechanism but I just he hasn't chosen the wrong price. You just need to know to choose. Yeah, yeah. The scope of error less than you actually you have to know very specifically. And you can show that the suppose for example that the true distribution was uniform from zero to two and you think it's from zero to one. You're gonna do your comparison under the same misleading models. You're still probably going to it's still roughly going to tell you when you're going to to shoot go for option versus fixed price. The, the, the number of the end is going to change, the critical end, but that's for most ends, you're still going to get the right choice. But then if you go for a fixed price, you'll get the price completely wrong. Whereas if it turns out to be for an option, you, get, you, you will have an issue because the price will set itself. Yep, exactly. Was there another question? Yeah. A quick clarification as well. Um, so the the um, I can function, go back if yeah. If you don't mind going back to the <coughs> equation for option, is how universal is that is that model? So it, so uh, in order to compute the expected profit from the the auction, I had to make an assumption about the distribution of valuations and. Keep in mind, I also made an assumption that those valuations were independent. So there are lots of cases in an auction model where you wouldn't want to, to, where you might be hesitant or might not be particularly confident in the distribution of the, the uh, valuations. But in particular, you wouldn't want to make the assumption that the valuations were independent. Um, the most common, at least in reality. In, in, so, in some auctions, it's, that's a reasonable assumption. And in other auctions, it's just not a reasonable assumption. Yeah. So, so anyhow, it's, um, I would say it's, this is a somewhat general model, but, but not completely general. It's not going to be a good. And the other thing is that we ruled out things like, um, we ruled out being able to bargain over the posted price. We ruled that out completely. We ruled out setting um, a reserve price in the auction and not selling if, if you're below that reserve price. So you know there were certain things we ruled out just to simplify the model. Yep. So there's actually sort of a very famous theorem in auction theory that says that um, in some kind of limited sense, all standard auction mechanisms are equivalent. Okay, and so that doesn't that doesn't mean they're equivalent in all ways, but it means like the expected revenue that the seller gets from a, a whole big set of standard auctions, regardless of what mechanism. And the English and the Dutch auction are, are in that set. Uh, the, their, the expected revenue is going to be the same. So, yeah, the that's. It's called, not surprisingly, the revenue equivalence theorem. So, yes? I'm just wondering, under what conditions can we assume independence? Because it seems to me that the prices that one person might offer will be conditional on what the other people are offering. Yeah. No, that's a good question. So the, the question is, under what circumstances does independence make sense? So let's suppose I'm auctioning off a bottle of wine. 
and it's a bottle of wine that the person who buys it is going to drink. Okay, so not likely to resell it, not likely to you know sort of do anything else with uh, do anything else with it, but just drink it. Well, then we can think the valuation that those buyers are are going to get from that bottle of wine can can reasonably be assumed to be independent. Okay. That's right, and you know, sort of the, the, the enjoyment you get from drinking that bottle of wine doesn't really uh, have anything to do with the enjoyment I would get from drinking that bottle of wine. So if we had envelopes, for example, for the price, then they're independent. I don't know what other people are writing, and I just... Well, no, no, so the, that's, so the, you're talking about the dependence in bidding as opposed to valuations. And I kind of glossed over the distinction between a bid and a valuation here. That's one reason why I use the English auction mechanism, uh, because in fact the optimal thing for bidder, we didn't talk about uh, what the optimal thing for bidders to do, but in the English auction the optimal thing for them to do is to bid their valuations. In some auctions the optimal thing to do is not to bid your valuation. So there is a distinction between a bid and a valuation. Here we didn't have to worry about it because of the mechanism I chose. Did you have a question? No, I was thinking, if you have enough, uh, a large enough end, it's sort of simple dependence in those cases. You get like three people and they're from the same. Well, no not, no, not necessarily. I mean, if, if for instance, um, so let's think of a case where the government is auctioning off the rights to cut down timber in a tract of land. So they have public lands and they're auctioning and there's sort of a bunch of firms who are going to go and sort of cut down timber and, and mill it and sell it. Um, so for instance, my valuation, I mean this is kind of a more complicated model, but in, in my valuation should depend on everyone else's valuations if I'm, you know, one of the potential bidders there because there's information in all of their valuations about how much timber is actually, you know, can be cut down and milled and, and what its market value is. This is like sort of a complicated, um, there's a complicated question of, you know, how to estimate the valuation. And so uh, your valuation is going to be um, relevant information for me as well in a case like that. Okay. So this just gives you a, a, a little taste of auction theory. I, I happen to like auctions, and I hope you thought it was uh, interesting. Uh, but there's sort of uh, lots of other um, interesting and, and sometimes complicated economic issues having to do with uh, auctions and auction theory. And uh, um, you know, but it's also a nice illustration to show you that um, order statistics, you know, are important in the real world too. So. Okay, so let's see. I still have a couple other things to say about auctions that will take us to the end of the lecture. So as I mentioned earlier, eBay, which was founded in 1995 as an online auction site exclusively, uh, now only has about 15% of its listings in auctions. Okay, so the vast majority of its listings are buy it now listings. There's also some uh, kind of best offer listings which are kind of a hybrid but the the um, the number of pure the percentage of pure auction listings is down to about 15 percent maybe lower by now 15 percent by sort of the the last time I saw the data okay so here's a graph illustrating that point so this is taken from an NBR working paper um, sort of mentioned up above and what they did is looked at, so the darker line is the share of active listings on eBay uh, as that are uh, listed in auction format. And you can see as recently as January of 2003, uh, that was almost 100% of active listings on eBay were auctions. And there have been some sort of changes in the rules, the listing rules in eBay over the years, but there has also been this sort of gradual decline over this period of, um, of auction listings. So now we're down to, like I said, about 15% and maybe even lower 
of active listings or auction listings. Was uh, January of 09 where they kind of reevaluated their structure? And so I should, I, should I should have looked that up to double check before I came in today. Um, there was some kind of a, yeah, there was some kind of a rule change that occurred there. Maybe it was sort of a, um, a difference in the, the uh, fees that they charge for different types of listings. And I knew that at one point and I forgot to look it up, but yeah. Pardon me? It ha yeah, um, although, I mean, this is, keep in mind, this is kind of, this is probably a decision that, that the macroeconomic uh, variables are not going to have a huge effect on. You're just a seller and you're like auction or posted price. So this isn't not, this is just the fraction of the listings that are auction versus posted price. Okay, so it's not, it's not like the number of listings plummeted. It's that the fraction that was uh, uh, auctions versus posted price plummeted. Okay. Um, so I said that. It says it in the bottom. Sorry. The sharp oh. drop in fall 2008 coincides with the decision <coughs> in September ah. 08 to allow good till cancel posted. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And here's another graph that illustrates kind of a similar phenomenon uh, using different data. So this is from the same paper. And what they did is they used Google Trends data. Has anyone used Google Trends data? What did you use Google Trends data for? Just to look up uh, different companies to see how they change the popularity. Okay. So, um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Google Trends, Google Trends is a sort of a free facility that Google makes available to anyone who wants to use it. And you can go on. Uh, to Google Trends and download data on the number of searches that have been done on particular search terms. And you can download the data over time, which is what they did here. So they were looking at the search term online auction versus the search term online prices. And they saw these sort of trends, uh, you know, over time changing. Uh, you can also use Google Trends to look at Google searches uh, geographically. So they, they can give you, you can sort of ask them to give you data on Google searches, um, you know, sort of by region or by state or by city. And so this, this is actually this is sort of an aside, but Google Trends can be a very useful tool uh, for, you know, sort of gathering uh, data for various purposes. So it basically just tells you how popular search terms on Google are. Okay, so what they did is they downloaded Google Trends data on it. And I should say also that Google Trends doesn't give you the raw number of searches. What they do is they give you some kind of a, um, I don't know, a normalized or uh, you know, a search volume index, I guess they call it. Okay. Um, so what they did here is they got Google Trends data on two search terms, online auctions and online prices. And um, you can see that there has been this sort of decrease from uh, the index high of around 90 to now uh, down to around 20 for the, um, for the search term uh, online auctions. The search term uh, online prices has, you know, has you know, bounced around quite a bit, but has maintained uh, something like uh, the same Google search volume. Okay, so this is an indication that people are just, they're as interested in online prices as they have been for a long time. They're getting less interested in online auctions. Okay? I would just be interested to see if we disaggregated the data by the type of goods, how that would pan out as well. Well, strange, <laughs> strange that you mention that. So, um, so what's going on? Okay. Um, so we, so we have a theory that we developed just a few minutes ago suggesting when a seller might prefer to sell an item with a posted price versus an, versus an auction. And that theory is useful for thinking about you know, information asymmetries. But it was an incomplete theory in the sense that the model didn't include anything about transactions costs. Okay? Um, and furthermore, these eBay graphs suggest that something has been changing over time. But that could be, you know, our theory could sort of suggest what has been changing over time that, that's driving these uh, trends, okay? 
So uh, three broad hypotheses. And I should say these, um, these are sort of more or less discussed in the, in the NBR um, working paper that I mentioned. Um, although, actually, they don't dis discuss three very much, which I think is kind of an important hypothesis. So um, one hypothesis is that there has been a compositional shift of sellers and types of products on eBay. Okay? So it used to be that eBay was mostly used for memorabilia, collectibles, antiques, you know, uh, estate jewelry, things like that. And now it's being used mostly for iPhones or Xboxes or whatever. Okay? And those products, the sort of new mix of products is not a, a bunch of products that where auction, the auction mechanism makes sense, basically. Could be that consumer tastes have changed. Online auctions are just not as fun as they used to be. So like in the late 1990s, everyone was just like, hey, I'm going to go on eBay and I'm going to buy something on auction. And then you know the sort of novelty wears off. And then you're like, oh, the transactions costs are killing me. I'm sick of this. So that's certainly my, I can tell you from my uh, you know, experience, that's, that's what happened. Um, and then also, as was pointed out earlier, the price discovery benefits of auctions have declined over time. Okay? So online search has made it easier to find prices for comparable items. But eBay itself might have killed the market for online auctions. Because eBay has created thick national markets for lots of things that didn't exist before. Those thick national markets provide information on uh, price. And so now maybe you just, you just go on eBay and you see, oh, what did this, um, this uh, uh, Liberty Head silver or um, Liberty Head gold dollar from 1863 sell for on eBay? OK, well, I got it. You know, I have like 20 auctions, date on 20 auctions. So now I know how to set my price. OK? So eBay may have, may have sort of been victimized by its own success in some, in some sense. OK? So um, the, the, the paper does a little bit of this. And let me just mention briefly. Um, I won't go into any detail. But what, they can do, what they've done in the paper is they can decompose the shift over time from auction to posted price, look exactly as you were suggesting, look at the different product categories, um, and look also at the experience of the typical seller. Because that lets you get at sort of some of these informational questions. Like if the sellers that are selling on eBay are just much more experienced than the sellers that were on eBay 15 years ago, uh, then maybe they don't need the, the sort of auction mechanism to tell them about the price distribution. And what they found, actually, was that uh, these explanations only account for a fairly small fraction of the shift. And instead, the returns to sellers uh, using auctions have diminished. Okay, and uh, if you're uh, interested, um, you can check and check that paper. But um, it's it's sort of a ni it's not a hard paper to read, and it's sort of a nice illustration of how you can uh, you know sort of take a data set and sort of decompose it to to answer different economic questions. Okay, so okay, we'll call it a day. <laughs>